Hello and welcome to another virtual conference live talks with myself, Dov Benyakov Kurtzman. And have you ever thought of um, what self is mm, or how your mind actually thinks? Some interesting questions that I think uh, Associate Professor Louise McHugh can answer us tonight, my special guest, a wonderful person. And uh, I met her three years ago, almost to the day, in uh, a world conference in Spain. And I was absolutely um, taken by her uh, wisdom and knowledge and her presentation skills. And so I'm so pleased that uh, she agreed basically to um, come in here and uh, be a guest for us on the virtual conference. I know that she's very popular all over the world. Um, the subject matter that she investigates and teaches is extremely complicated. Um, I can't say that I um, am a big, uh, you know, I understand it, it only a little tiny, 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 tiny bit. Um, and anything that I can hear from Louise on this is just golden nuggets. And so um, I really, really uh, think that it's important that you attend here, whether you're on live uh, on Facebook or whether you're live on YouTube, or indeed you're watching this on replay, um, you're going to be in for a treat um, for the next um, 40 odd minutes or so. Now, um, Bit of housekeeping, so if you want to ask Louise anything or you've got any comments for her, then put them in the comments and hopefully they'll pop up for us and uh, we will get them uh, straight to Louise. Please put your name in the comments, otherwise we might not know who you are. Of course, if you don't, if you want to be anonymous, then that is fine too. Um, so without further ado, um, we're going to... Um, we're going to meet uh, Louise McHugh and we'll bring her out of the green room. So big welcome to Louise. Thank you very much uh, for joining me tonight. Oh, it's great to be talking to you. Um, so basically, uh, the whole idea of this virtual conference was basically because of all the coronavirus and the fact that people will be going into lockdown. And uh, I thought, well, is there anything, you know, I can do from, from the point of view of my skills and my values? What, you know, what matters to me? And I thought, well, I would like to be a conduit, a channel to try and get some sort of information and wisdom out there to help general public. And, uh, you know, the best way that I thought I could do this is to turn to the people that I know that actually know something um, and that are studying it and writing about how to, you know, get through life, even though there are lots of distresses. And um, there's no doubt about it that we're all living, you know, no matter where you are in the world, um, we're living under a certain amount of distress that might even be higher than the regular distress that we have in life um, because of all the situation that we're going through. So that might be health distress is frightening of going outside. I know I am, um, you know, not being in touch with family, um, economic worries now. Do I have a job? Do I not have a job? Business, no business. And even if I've got a business, is anybody going to come out anymore and buy things for me because everybody's in the house? Um, and of course, different parts of the world now, and there are people watching this from, you know, all over, all different parts, Canada, America, Australia, Israel, uh, you know, and the four nations here at home of uh, um, Ireland, Scotland, uh, Wales and England. And uh, they're all different stages of lockdown or opening up into, into what's supposed to be what's called the new normal, whatever that means. Um, but there's no doubt about it that what's common to everybody is the fact that distress is high. Um, and so I turned to my own community, basically, which is the ACBS community, and I thought, okay, these are the people that I know that have something to offer. And so that's why 
among others, I turned uh, to you, Louise. Um, but before we get into kind of anything like that, maybe you could um, do a little bit of introducing of yourself. I think you can do more justice to yourself than me. So um, just give the viewers that, I mean, uh, there's lots of people on here that really know you, but there's probably a lot of people here that have, have not heard of you. So if you could just give a little bit of introduction on who you are, Louise. Sure. I'm a professor of psychology. Um, that's changed since the, the COVID restrictions. I got promoted <laughs> during lockdown. Um, I'm a professor of psychology in University College Dublin. Um, and I've been doing research in uh, context paper science for the last uh, 20 years. Um, and yeah, so I, I run a research lab and I'm an acceptance and commitment trainer. And I'm particularly interested in um, language or thinking, if, if you want to think of it that way, and our sense of self um, and how we um, develop a sense of self and, and how our sense of self can be challenging for us at times. Right. So um, wonderful. And uh, I'm pleased that out of your busy life that you've managed to give us this time. But, you know, the, the interesting thing about this, and we had uh, Dr. Nomi Baum on here uh, a few days ago, and one of the things that she brought up was the interesting thing here is the helpers and the helped are basically in the same, uh, un going under the same distresses. You know, you know, normally, hopefully, um, the person that's helping is in a little bit different uh, stage than the person that's being helped. Although ACT actually brings out that we're all kind of in the same boat anyway. Um, but we're really all going through the same distresses. How do you personally cope with this going through these times? What's actually happening? In, are you in Ireland at the moment? Yeah, I'm in Ireland at the moment. Uh, yeah. and I, What's the situation there? Yeah, so we're we're in, in lockdown. We've got sort of five phases of our, our way out of lockdown. Um, but, you know, we have been sort of restricted to two kilometres within our home and now five kilometres um, and definitely, I think that piece around sort of everyone being in that same boat is really, uh, really clear at the moment. And um, I was talking to some um, frontline professionals and then I was talking to the general public and I was surveying people to get sort of common thoughts that people are struggling with around this. Um, and it was interesting to see that commonality around, you know, I can't cope with this. What if I infect somebody I love? Um, mm. I don't know what my, my, my purpose is. I, I, I feel unsure of my job changes. Um, so these were commonalities among people who were um, frontline or, or not frontline. I mean, for all of us right now, this is something that is um, bringing up huge uncertainty um, and changing all of our lives in, in sort of really radical ways. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to ask you a kind of, um you know, maybe a very uh, pertinent question, but do you practice what you preach? I mean, do you do you use your own material to help you get through this? Yeah, definitely. So I think um, I think all the pivoting towards um, what what matters and and what you value in in the small ways that you can, even with all the restrictions, um, is something that really helps me. Um, and also the the sort of daily practice in, in mindfulness really helps to sort of ground me and reconnect to, okay, how can I be the person that I want to be today in whatever small ways? So if what's important to me is connection and contribution, which are things that I care about being about, there are ways, even when it feels like the world has become very small and very boring, um, and that lots of the ways that we connect to others or lots of ways that I would contribute um, aren't available. Um, but still coming back and thinking, but what ways can I bring those actions, even in small ways today, definitely has been um, a saviour in the, 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 the days that are more difficult during this, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I, I agree entirely. I mean, I use this, you know, everything that I've been learning here of everybody over the last few weeks, and we've had some great people here. Um, and just in general, what I've been learning, and I, it's about... It's not just academic, it's real and it works and it's uh, it's very good. Um, so there's a few comments coming in. So um, Sherry Turrell is watching, she's in the house. 
So glad to be here. She says, may have to leave a bit early, so we'll find recording if necessary. Yep, there will be a recording and you will be able to see it. So thanks for joining Sherry all the way from Toronto. So um, Amy Murrell is also here. So she agrees with you. Um, uh, same here, she says, oh, regarding Sherry. And um, Amy says, congratulations. Is that because you've become a full professor now? I think maybe that is what. <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, that's, that is fantastic. When I was thinking about bringing you on, I wasn't sure. You got, I couldn't remember you actually had it. You didn't have it. But that's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, we've got a Facebook user who's saying uh, hi. Sometimes I don't, sometimes people like to be anonymous, but sometimes I get it on my um, <laughs> my, my phone rather than uh, the software. So if anything comes up that I can say their names, then I'll, I'll definitely say them. Um, well, I've got another Facebook user who says chat like chats like this are our ways of acting on our value of connection. Absolutely. And that's the idea. The idea is to connect. And we know that connection, um, and it's it, you know it's it's backed up in science that social connection is is the antidote to many 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 problems and and also um, prevention of many many problems. And I think with this whole idea of isolation, um, and we like to call it maybe physical isolation, hopefully not too much social isolation, but yeah, it's going to bring its own problems, isn't it? It's going because humans need connection. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so much love, Louise, uh, you're getting there. And also thanks for this, says Denise from Manchester. Tamar from uh, Israel is saying, I'm happy to be here too. Oh, and uh, Sherry's come back with, we're smiling back at you, Louise. Thanks for bringing some brightness to the day along with Dov. Wonderful. So happy that all... Um, all of you are joining us. And of course, uh, any other comments or questions, just put them up and we'll get them to Louise. And if you want your name mentioned, please put your name on the comment. Right. So um, the idea was that it's nice to talk, but it's really important to do something, really important to actually experience, um, you know, some sort of way of coping, dealing, understanding even um, what we're going through. And if there's any possible way of helping people. Um, but you're a person who studies the mind and studies uh, how we think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, you know, what, how do we think? How do we think? Um... I'm thinking about a way uh, or an example of this that, that might make it more accessible at this time. Um, and there is a, a funny thing that happened with Corona beer sales in, in the US where mm. coronavirus came out, sales of Corona beer dropped. Um, not funny for the company, but no. what an illustration of is um, the way we think, uh, certainly from this perspective, context behavior science. Um, and there's, there's evidence to support that, is that we relate things in terms of each other. Um, and there's an example of relating things as the same, uh, even though it's not necessarily uh, rational to now mm. respond to Corona beer as problematic and something you don't want. That's the way our, our, our minds operate. We relate things as they're the same. We relate things as different, as opposite to, um, and we relate things in comparison, what's better, what's worse. Um, and because we can do that, that allows us to plan and reason and problem solve. Um, and that's sort of at the heart of our thinking. Um, but that relating also, um, we also do that with ourselves. So we also relate ourselves in ways that we see ourselves as opposite to, or not as good as, or see someone else as better than us. So that sort of mm -hmm. comparison piece, that capacity to relate things in comparison to each other. Um, and opposite and distinction and same uh, is something that then comes back on, uh, well, allows us to develop a, a story about who we are in the world, but then that particular story can cause us to, to get a bit stuck and it can cause us to, to suffer as well. Um, because at times we can think that we fall short of being um, as good as others or as being, uh, we can get into a game of wanting to be somehow and being able to be better than so that we can be special mm. to connect without mm. realizing that wanting to, in chasing 
to be better than in comparison actually misses what we really want, which is to connect to others. Um, and I think an, an example of this is my my nephew when he was when he was younger, when he was nine. Um, he 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 really kind of got into this business of of comparing himself to others and telling them that he was better than them. So he would do something and tell his friends that he was better than them and why. Um, and of course, that didn't really breed the type of connections he might have been hoping for. Um, so this, and I think there's a little bit of, of that in all of us that we sort of think that by somehow being, if we can be better, um, that we can, in comparison to others, and that if we're special, that's what we want. But really, that disconnects us and um, stops us from really getting those connections that we do want. So I think, yeah. Sorry. I was going to say it's really it's really amazing what you're saying because it's so relevant I think to today's lifestyle and I'm not talking about the lockdown I'm talking about the the social media lifestyle that we have because the first of all the amount of people that we can compare ourselves to now has as the new word is exponentially everybody's using that word now but exponentially exploded I mean if you could you know when I was growing up we compared yourself probably for the people in the street friends people in the class that's all we knew you know or in a club for in a football club or something but now you're comparing yourself to people all over the world and some people are you know live completely different lives than you you know have completely different lifestyles and it might seem much more attractive under their circumstances, but you know, from where I am, and I'll want to be that, you know. And so, then there's the whole Instagram kind of thing where I'll try to change the way I look to be even better than I think I am. And I think the ultimate one, I mean, e even these are mild compared to those who actually go through operations to change their faces. Um, or get injections of all sorts of materials because, not because they actually need it and there's some sort of, you know, been in an accident or something, but because they don't think that they're um, the way that they want to look and they sh should look much better than that. And sometimes you find that it's not exactly, um, you know, it's very subjective, isn't it? So, you know, sometimes that look that they get, but everybody's becoming to look the same because they all wanted to look with the, the big lips and the, and the and the and the brows and so on, and actually I was talking to um, you know a surgeon who can do these things, and he said, you know the 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 some of the things that people get done to themselves in order to look better, he knows it, he does it, um, is actually making them uh, because they freeze their face a lot of the time, gives it an autistic look in a way. So in some senses, they're actually disconnecting. Mm -hmm. from the the society rather than what they're wanting to do is connect. So I find even just in that opening, Louise, it's, it's, it's crucial that we understand this if we're going to have any sort of quality in life because it can take us down roads if we don't understand it that can be quite, um, quite distressing, I would say. I think it's it's that we it's the game of comparison. If if that's the if that's the game that you're in, that trying to be better than and sort to achieve this sort of um, ideal or this comparison that we can never kind of get to. Because if the game is I want to be better, 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 and um, there's there's a level at which I'm I'm sort of missing a broader sense of my relationship with myself. So any choices that we make are fine but we don't want our choices to be when we're caught in that comparison game and um, always wanting to be something more or better and um, just to be um, okay or worthy. But I think right. because we can compare ourselves um, because we can relate in comparison um, and opposite to and different to that can start us sort of chasing, thinking it'll be okay when I'm better um, rather than uh, sort of connecting to a, a broader sense of me as it's okay even when I have thoughts that I'm not uh, worthy or not enough. And in fact, because of the way minds work, because we relate things to each other, um, in terms of each other even, it, there's no way that all of us won't have times where we don't feel enough. Um, mm. And it's more a case that we want to start to notice that, ah, 
there's my mind giving me uh, comparisons. <laughs> you know, it's playing that comparison game rather than getting sucked into thinking, I need to do something to prove that I'm better. Just noticing, oh, my mind's just doing what minds do. It's right. comparing right now. Um, and it's it's pulling myself into that comparison and making me Is feel- Is there an upside to comparing? Oh yeah, you know, you know, in, in the capacity to actually uh, engage in comparison is really critical to um, a lot of our ability to problem solve. So, you know, even in, in you know, as young as kids' maths, you know, they're, they're doing more than, less than, monetary value, um, and then on up to all problems. So being able to compare, to, to being able to relate in all these ways um, is really, really important for us to be able to have high level skills of um, cognition. Um, so planning, reasoning, as I said, um, and that's great. But then it's when we stop noticing that or when we don't notice that um, comparing is a skill that I can use to plan and reason and we start to get stuck on thinking we are the way that we set the comparisons. So mm. I'm not as good as that and start believing that as a fact uh, rather than noticing, oh, my mind's doing that comparison thing that it, it, it does with me right now rather than in a useful in a way of solving a useful problem to be solved. Right. So I, in, in in regards to ourselves, when we start seeing ourselves as the problem to be solved, and I think Kelly Wilson would, would, would say that a lot, that that's when we start to get into um, a, a, a bit of a problem because, um, you know, the endless, the comparisons that we can engage in, as you said, uh, are endless. You know, there's always more and more and more people to compare myself. And because our minds are able to just relay things in these ways that are arbitrary, I can actually come up with an ideal me that I'm not living up to being. It doesn't even have to be another person to compare myself. There can be an ideal yeah. Louise that's never existed that I can yeah. feel that I'm not living up to. So the Louise that's a really good cook, I can feel bad about not being as good as her. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's infinite, isn't it? I think I think what's what's important here is the fact that we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is a great skill to have. And as you said, problem solving on the outside. It's just that when we start to start problem solving ourselves, that's where we start to get into a lot of difficulty with this because it's kind of infinite, isn't it? We can come up with all sorts of ideas. What I'd like to touch on a little bit is about self. You know, what is ourselves? Who are we from that point of view of self? But before we do that, I just want to bring in some of the viewers because um, lots of stuff coming in. So Vered is saying thank you to both. And Naftali says, as an expert in RFT, have you encountered any language traps, in inverted commas, that are prevalent now during this public health crisis that might be good um, to watch out for. So bringing it home to, to what's happening now. Um, I think one language trap that it is appearing in, in the media at the moment, and I think it is a place that we can go because we can relate things as distinct to us and because we really don't want to associate and relate ourselves to this virus. You know, you can hear things that that um, where we relate the virus to other. So we might say the Chinese virus. And I would say that's a language trap. Um, where we're, it, it's comforting to put it as distinct if, if you're not Chinese to put it as distinct to you um, but I think we need to be careful in doing that because that's just again that's just language it makes me feel comfortable for it to be distinct to me that's just relating and yeah. um, yeah. this all of us we're all humans we can all get this and I have noticed that and I noticed that relation of distinction that is, is coming out in the media um, and I think we need to be careful with the prejudices that can get set up uh, at a time of uncertainty, we so much want to, to, to you know, our minds try to create division and um, to make us feel safe, but just being cautious of that. Um, and I think another trap that that sort of can come up is um, our roles. And, you know, a lot of our roles are changing. Um, and so for, for some people, um, they're, they're sort of the way that they relate to themselves, you know, so imagine if two of the roles are now colliding. So uh, for parents, that's very prevalent because uh, parents who are now homeschooling and trying to work, if they're trying to do both all of a sudden, um, you might find that somebody sees themselves as, you know, I'm an attentive parent. And then they also see themselves as a contributing colleague. Um, and now they can be in a situation where their sense of self can feel challenged because they're neither homeschooling well, so not being the attentive parent, 
nor kind of being able to contribute properly in attending meetings or doing the sort of the, the way that they would normally contribute when they're in the workplace. So I think that's a sort of another um, way that our, the way we language about ourselves can trap us because former ways that we would describe ourselves can now feel a bit conflicted. Um, yeah. And in that, it's it's a sense then of trying to come back to um, being able to see how can I bring small amounts of these things that I care about and being an attentive parent and being a contributing colleague with this broader framework of this is a global pandemic and it's going to be yeah. going to be the same as it was before in terms of how much I can do that. You know, I I, I uh, just came up with the idea that's close to my heart is you know is is that kind of you know, social fabric that can go in, get can go into danger of breaking down because of the prejudices. For instance, just from the point of view of um, people that are maybe not abiding exactly to the lockdown rules as they're set out. So there's these people that can be named murderers and they can be named, you know, wanting to ruin their society because they're going around infecting everybody. And then there's us here who are, you know, locked up in our houses and we're protecting. And what I worry about is that, you know, hopefully this will be over one day, but there might be left that kind of residue of, yeah, these are the people and that come from that area that didn't really, you know, they were in the parks, you know, sunbathing during lockdown. And, you know, they were, they are kind of labeled now, um, you know, antisocial or all sorts of horrible words that I've seen being used and, you know, including murderers and, and whatever. Um, and that is all about language as well, isn't it? I think at times of threat and uncertainty, othering, if you want to call it that, is where, you know, I'm different to you, that group and this group becomes more heightened. Um, so that is something that we want to sort of check in with and notice when we're uh, when we're when we're engaging in that, when we're starting to see see ourselves as different to other groups um, or trying to blame other groups Um you know, in a discerning way, obviously, you know, I think being able to check in with not wanting to overly label or put too much on a group in a, in a way that's just too easy to categorize without fully looking at all of the, the aspects of what's going on. So just knowing that our minds do that, that our minds do try to, mm. to see things as distinct um, and checking in with that and, and seeing does that align to my values of connection to others, um, you know. Yeah. If that's Thank you for that. And thank you, Naftali, for that brilliant question. And Miriam Moore is saying, is the tendency to relate in contradiction to uh, in cognitive flexibility? So I think... So they, you know, yeah. Go on. Uh, so when we, we learn to, you know, when we're learning to relate to the world and symbols and use words in the world, um, you know, we learn these these skills through the natural parent-child naming game and we get really reinforced for being right in in labeling things the way the world wants us to so you know if I, I if, if if I say to a child what's this and they say a banana I'll say no no that's not right but if they say a glass I'll be well done that's great um, and what kind of happens as they're learning to relate in the world or oh, that is a glass uh, is they also learn that it's good to be right <laughs> about the way you relate um, mm. as that happens, we can get a bit rigid with thinking that when I relate something, that's my position and that's true. And I should be right because it's better if I'm right. So we can get a bit mm. defended in, in and, and we can get a bit rigid around the way that we relate to the world right. and, ourselves and, um, and our beliefs. And it's and I suppose then it's a case that we want uh, with ACT, we want to acceptance and commitment therapy and training. We want to help people to notice that actually these are just patterns of relating. Um, so th that's what we're doing. We're promoting flexibility to, you know, being right isn't what's important. It's more about what, mm. what, what matters to you. So I think inherently built into this learning how to relate um, to make the world coherent initially and, and relating coherent is that we think it's important to be right and coherent in how we relate to the world. Yes, this is a glass. That makes sense. Um, but then we kind of want to pull back from this rigid sense we've made out of the world in the way we're relating and sort of start to notice where does the way I've learned to relate to the world help me and where is it actually hindering me? And that's mm. coming back to be more flexible. So if I relate to the world and think of myself as, well, I've had a repeated number of failures, therefore I'm a failure, that relating is coherent, 
but it's not in any way useful to me um, in moving forward in the world because that's just going to block me and stop me. So, yeah, so I think in a sense, the way that we learn to relate in the world and we don't really teach children to notice um, this is just relating, we sort of set it up that it's good to be right and relate in certain ways. I think that can um, uh, be contradictory to, to the sort of more flexibility mm. that we might want for, um, for being healthy. When I was growing up, um, especially from when I was in primary school and in, and towards the end of primary school, but basically the whole time I was there, I went through a whole lot of, I was grew up in Glasgow in a, in a tough part of Glasgow, and there was a lot of bullying going on. And so um, as that happened until I was a living and a half and I found my fists and I'm very proud of it. But until that time, until that time, I, I received the fist on the other end many, many, many times over these years. But I related myself as... Um, as an outcast, basically, and I related to these people as not just these people that were in my class, but everybody that I came across in the neighborhood were to blame. That, that was I kind of painted everybody with the same brush. And growing up and the education I got from my home and so on and so forth, I established for myself a sense of self, a sense of who I was and, 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 and what I was. <clears throat> Later on, um, I managed to go through a lot of therapy, and so I managed to, to change all that. But, um, but a sense of self is that something that we we create when we're when we're young, and we hold on to it, and might be eventually um, out of date, you know, out of use, and it's not being updated to to what I am now. Or is that something completely different? Yeah. So you know, we're we're constantly asked ask questions about you know about ourselves right I mean even at the start of this I would have introduced to you know who am I um, and in any situation an interview meeting a new person we're, they're always going to ask us questions about ourselves you know who are you what do you want what do you believe what do you prefer what do you like and you know so we, we over time and, and from when we're young we're asked these questions as well and we sort of abstract a sense of who we are by by learning to talk about I uh, as different to everyone else and, and the experiences that I have and what I like and don't like. And we create this coherent story about who we are. Um, but some of that story, uh, or if you like, that story can be a bit of an illusion. And uh, because we, if we get too attached to it as, as the way I am, it limits us. Um, because of course, all of those ways in which we describe ourselves, labels, whether it's say impulsive or honest or um, whatever it might be, um, any label, if held too tightly, is limiting. Because nobody can be any label 100% of the time. You know, um, as much and all as I like to describe myself as, as honest, um, there are times when, when I lie. You know, and, and, and I don't want it to be that that makes me feel not myself or somehow yeah. going to keep myself. Because sometimes it's useful. Um, you yeah. know, if I arrive late for a staff meeting, it, it's not particularly... Uh, sensible if I start giving them an honest answer as to why, you know. Um, yeah. So we, we want to be able, so we, we learn across time and uh, through to responding to questions about ourselves and our wants and our desires and wishes, to being able to relate to ourselves in comparison to others. We get this story about who we are, who is Louise McHugh, who is Dov. Um, but then I suppose from the acceptance and commitment therapy point of view, we want to help people to notice that there is actually a broader sense of self that is a stable sense of self that is different to the story that we get attached to. Um, so there's this broader sense of self that is uh, where I am, I'm, I'm the witness of everything that Louise has experienced, um, but I'm not any one of the labels or the descriptions or the evaluations. They're just, they're just too limited to be really what I am in the broader sense. So we want to gain that sort of broader sense that what is stable and what is me across time is that I witness everything, every experience, every feeling, every thought that Louise has. Um, but that the stories uh, that I hold, the labels that I give, they can change. It doesn't matter if I do, am not honest today. Um, that doesn't somehow damage the, the stability of what Louise's mm. perspective is. Is there something that we can do to help us and people watching to help us kind of get in touch with that sense of self that you're referring to? Yeah, and I was uh, could do an exercise. Could do an exercise. Yeah, yeah. great. 
Um, just to, to st before I do the self exercise, I might do a little a, a brief in the in the spirit of Nano <laughs> workshop, a little brief values an exercise to help us clarify what matters um, in in a way that will also sort of illustrate the power of relating. <laughs> this relating we've been talking about. I I want to uh, use a, a relation of of opposition, an opposite, if you like. Um, what I want people to do is to to think about somebody out there in the world, maybe in the public eye. Um, and I want them to think, just think of someone in the public eye or somebody well-known that behaves in a way in their life that is the exact opposite of who they want to be. Mm. So somebody out there that, you know, I can think of somebody now, I, I don't need to, 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 to name and shame anybody, even if I don't know them, um, yeah. but think of somebody and then I want everybody to think about with that person, what is it about them and the way they conduct themselves that is absolutely the opposite of how you want to be? So in my person, the things about them that are the opposite of what I want to be is that they're, they're, they're selfish and, and prejudiced. Um, in the way that they conduct themselves in the world, and they, they bring the qualities of selfishness and, and, and a prejudiced attitude. Um, and so I just want everyone to sort of think about what are the qualities about this person that are the ones that, yeah, they're the things I do not want to be. Um, so I'm thinking selfish and prejudice. And then I want, I want people to think about for you, what is the opposite? of these things you've identified. So for me, what is the opposite of selfish and prejudice? Um, and the opposite of that, uh, of selfish and prejudice, it will be connected and understanding, um, would be for me, the opposite. And what that's doing is it's telling me about the way I want to conduct myself in the world um, all the time, and also at this time of, of uncertainty with coronavirus. Um, so I want sort of people to, to ident having identified those ways they want to be in, in the world, we sort of come back to that. Um, but I just want to do a, an exercise to help connect to this broader sense of self. Mm. I think at the moment, I'm going to do it now, but I think at the moment we can feel very stuck, um, and not really notice variability in our experience because we're in Groundhog Day, <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know it, it's it's all the same, and we can get really stuck in a certain think that it's just one mood or one thought, boring. Um, and I, I want us to sort of see, or or with the challenging thoughts that we might have around ourselves about maybe things like I'm not being productive enough, I can't cope, or whatever those thoughts are too. Um, I, I just want to do a, a little exercise that might help people sort of noticing the variability of experience that yeah, even yeah. when we feel it's just this. Um, so what I, I want you to do is I'm going to get people to just look away from the screen rather than close their eyes just because it's nice to look away from a screen. <laughs> and I, I just, I want you to notice the sounds that you can currently hear. I want you to notice any changes or variations in what you can hear. And I want you to let your eyes just gaze around the room that you're in. I just want you to notice the different things that you can see. Now 
I want you to just gently orient your attention to what you can feel, your physical sensations that you can feel right now. It might be the feeling of your feet in your shoes, the feeling of your legs against the chair, the tightness in your chest, whatever's there. I want you to just notice the current sensations that are there. And also noticing any slight variations or changes in those sensations. I want you to now bring to mind just one way that you describe yourself. As I said, ways I describe myself are impulsive, honest. Just thinking of one way that you describe yourself. There's no right or wrong description. And I want you to bring to mind times when that description is not true of you. And extending kindness to yourself in, in noticing that variability. I want you to, in a spacious way, notice that there's a part of you, a witness, that although what you see, what you hear, what you feel, the way you think about yourself, that all of those things change, sometimes more fast than others. But even though all those things change, there's a part of you that witnesses all this change. And that part of you was here long before coronavirus. That part of you will be here after to witness all of these experiences. What I invite you to do in noticing that, that witness that can allow this variability, I want you to connect to those um, values that you identified that are the opposite of someone. So for me, that was understanding and connection. And I want you to just bring to mind what is one small thing that you can do today, this evening, That is about being that person. So for me, being a connected, understanding person. What is one small thing you can do, even with all the variability of feelings, thoughts, that will show up from that place of a witness? What is one thing that you can do that is about moving in a direction that you care about? being the person you want to be.
And in thinking about that, just extending kindness to yourself, particularly now and always, in noticing that a lot of the things we, we might want to do are quite limited now. But even with those limits, there are ways we can be the person we want to be. That's not about stories or descriptions, but about connecting to who we want to be in the world. And then just radiating a sense of kindness to yourself. Thank you for bearing with me for that. <laughs> Wow. So um, that was amazing. I find it very comforting. I don't know everyone will have their own experiences, but I find it very comforting um, to get in touch with that witness as you talk, spoke about um, as somebody that's, and we've all got our own stories, but I've witnessed all sorts of things in myself <laughs> through the years. Um, some of the things I'm not so proud of and some of the things um, I am proud of, but getting in touch with that witness and kind of separating myself from these things has a certain comfort that goes with us because it I think even responsibility you know we have a lot of responsibility in our lives it doesn't matter what task we're doing with it. you're a professor that's a massive responsibility or um you know a head of an organization or an employee even or a parent or you know, many, many things, lots of doctors and nurses is watching this just now. So there's a lot of responsibility out there. And sometimes it can be so heavy, you know, because that it becomes part of that story. And, oh, my goodness, I, I can't sleep because I've got so much responsibility the next day and so on and so forth. And I think that just being able to take a little step back, even a tiny step and say, you know, OK, this is another thing that's happening. But, you know, I'm I'm. You know, I don't know how to explain. It's not bigger than this or different than this, but it's detached a little bit from this. I find it personally very comforting. It's the first time I've heard witness being used. I think that's great. I've usually heard observer and things like that, but I actually like the word uh, witness. I think it's, um, I think it has that sense of you know I can see everything, but it's not me because you know. You know, witness usually witnesses something that's not uh, that's not part of them. Yeah. So I, I I really appreciate that very much. Yeah. Um, we've got a few other things, and then uh, a few other questions coming in, and then um, we can finish off. So, uh, uh, Vered says, "Amazing how a small change in one word can change a whole narrative and perspective." Thank you. Yeah, it is amazing how that works. How we're so really attached to language. I mean, it has such a powerful effect on us that, you know, changing that word, just even using that word witness or observer or whatever, gives us a whole different perspective and can give us a whole different perspective. And I think we want to, we just want to give ourselves that spaciousness from being sucked into the story to just come back to actually what matters to me in this. You know, I'm not that, I, you know, I can just look at that and that can be there. And that's absolutely the fact that I have those thoughts as part of me. That's fine. Mm. I don't have to be controlled by thoughts. I can, I can remember, I can come back to, I care about connecting and understanding and I can do as much of that as I can do in this moment. Um, you know, and, we're, and we are all, you know, hooked in by our thoughts one way or another, and some more than others. And you know, I, you know, I've I've had the days that I'm super ruminating for for hours and on. Oh yeah, especially when it comes to conflict. I'm, I've I've been a combat soldier, but I hate conflict. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, whenever conflict comes, I I that's when I've got a tendency to get into rumination uh, mode, and it can it could last for days if I hadn't can't you know do what you're saying to do and it's um you know i think all of us have that tendency we can get our thoughts can really get us into trouble uh, sometimes 100 it's and i think it's it's about practicing 
these sort of skills so we can come back as as quickly as we can or quicker mm. each time. It's, it's it's never gone right <laughs> yeah it's about recovering from it as quickly as you can bouncing back absolutely naftali says not to mention that as i distance the threat via language and attribution all these rules and regulations about socialization social isolation don't really apply to me well yeah i mean there's that as well there's people that because of language this applies this doesn't apply you know i'm part of this group part of that group Thank you, Naftali, for that. Well, um, if we come back to the sort of values of, of you know, connection, then if in my case, connection, it's harder for me to slip into those don't, rules don't apply to me because that's not really how, about how I want to be in the world, right? Because that's mm. just my mind letting me off the hook in a way that doesn't really fit my larger values, right? And yeah. um, my value of we are all connected and I want to connect to, you know, contribution connect to the the rest of the group that i live in to help them and then getting entangled if that's the value getting entangled in well this rule doesn't really apply to me it's, it's harder to to get yeah. entangled in that and yeah and, and even when you you really honestly um believe that this rule doesn't apply to me but what does apply to me is that i'm part of the group i'm part of society i live here i get benefits from wherever i live and I want to be part of um, benefiting and contributing to everybody else's life, even though, yeah, I, I, you know, if it was really up to me, then the more I care about Corona, I'd go off to the islands and, you know, I would just, you know, be in a, some little island and be on my own. But um, that's not really, you know, my, my uh, values is I actually want to be part of uh, where I live and, be, and, and help and be helped when I need it. Um, and, and it's a two-way thing, isn't it? So there's, you know, there's that as well. Um, Denise says, does it work the other way that people who would never have associated together before are now labeled together? Um, example, now they are all safe, uh, self-isolated quarantine key workers. Now there's new groups that have been invented, if you like. And that's what we sort of really want to see. And we definitely saw some of that com coming out where people came together. And so like at times a thread, of course, we can go distinct, but also what it can do is it can bring together. So we can start to see that we are grouped together. Um, and we want more of that, that, that sort of belonging together group, because it's more useful at a time of threat for people to come together and mm -hmm. to unite it, they'll be able to uh, combat it. So you do see those, those, um, those, same relations we are the same even though people who didn't see themselves the same before can now see we are together in this as a, as a group um and you know that is quite functional right now for us all to, to see ourselves as part of the, the collective because ne now more than ever really we're well certainly now as a great example that we're seeing how we are so interconnected <laughs> um, yeah absolutely and 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 how we're really dependent on each other's behavior for for even our own our own health, but the the health of uh, of the society that we live in, the world that we live in at the moment, absolutely. Um, Mary says it is better to label our thoughts than ourselves. Yeah, so I think it's it's this this case of just noticing that thoughts are just thoughts, um, all thoughts, you know, and it can be thoughts about um, others, ourselves, things in the world. We just want to have that little bit of distance to notice that my mind has lots of thoughts. Uh, and then when I notice that they're just thoughts, that's when I can start to look at, well, are these thoughts useful for me or not? Uh, are these labels useful for me or not? And sometimes they might be, sometimes they won't be. So we don't want to get into a, is it true or not game? Cause that, that game kind of pulls us in the wrong direction. You kind of want to come back and think, does labeling myself like this uh, is it useful for me or not? Or is this thought I'm having right now, is it a useful thought? Is it bringing me closer to what I, I care about being? Or is it is it pulling me in, in directions that aren't useful? Yeah. So thank you, Mary, for that. What came up in my mind when you were doing that exercise, you know, with the person that might come up in your mind that um, is behaving in a way that is not in line with my values? Um, and I thought, wow, that it's amazing. Because if, let's say, I come across a person that I really don't like, well, I can actually, um, out of that, see the things that are important to me because, because I, you know, you can see the opposite there. So I'm thinking, wow, 
I don't like these things, but these are the things that I do like, which are the opposite of that. So instead of focusing on, oh, I hate that guy or that woman or whatever, that person, because of that, I could actually say, well, you know what, That's it's kind of bringing out in me these values that I maybe never have thought that that was what. And in, 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 in therapy with our friends, when we're trying to capture if someone's saying, I just don't know what I care about, an opposite is a good way to come in, um, yeah. you know. So what do you not care about? Uh, it could right. even yeah. well, come back from that. Yeah, because yeah, because there are a lot of people, and I've met a few of them, and I probably one myself at one point that they, they you kind of some you know a lot of the time you just go through life because it's busy and you're just doing the things and 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 to actually turn around and say you know what do I care about? It's like oof, that's a big question. Um, but I tend to know what I don't care about. I tend to know what I don't like much easier. And yeah. so by sitting down and just saying, okay, this is what I don't like, this is what I really don't care about, this is what I, you know, detest, out of that, we can actually dig in and see all these diamonds of what really I, I do care about, I think. You know, I think, I think that's a great way of doing it. Yeah. Um, another Facebook user says, Wally, thank you so much. To allow myself to get in touch with um, Antidote is very helpful in a compassionate way. Um, yeah, I mean, getting in touch with myself is, as we see, is well. I think I think it's, I think it's something that we don't um, yet. I mean, you differently, but generally speaking, we don't yet um, deal with enough. We're always dealing with others, you know. Um, but getting, I mean, I've got your books, and I and I find them fascinating. And the idea of just examining. You know ourselves, I think, has a massive uh, benefit. Naftali's come back with congratulations, Louise, on your promotion, and thank you, wishing you continued success and, of course, health. So thank you, Naftali, for that too. Um, Louise, for me, it's been fascinating. It's been wonderful. It's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And um, I hope one day soon that we will have the opportunity of meeting in person yeah. Again, and this. It's sorry, I didn't hear you. Thank you so much for doing this. It's lovely. I find that I really gravitate towards the the sessions that are are live in in in, in life at the moment, and uh, with, with people that I I know, and 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 people, yeah, like I really noticed that Dennis Tursh does his live meditation at twelve, and you're doing these sessions, and Mark Oliver reads a storybook in the evening, and it's it, there's something about seeing people that that. You know, not just characters on the telly that I think at the moment is 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 um, really nourishing me. Yeah, so thank you. In the meantime, Professor Louise McHugh, thank you very much. <laughs>